All right, we'll get started. Thank you everyone for joining us um, for our Sokolo lecture, Maurice Sokolo lecture, Cardiology Grand Rounds today. Um, this is an annual lecture that honors the creative researcher, respected teacher, and beloved member of UCSF community, Dr. Maurice Sokolo and his family. Dr. Sokolo was a pioneer of modern clinical treatment of hypertension. He was a founding member of the UCSF CVRI, and he served as the first chief of cardiology from 1953 to 1973. His research contributions led to the discovery of white coat hypertension, the Sokolo Lion electrocardiogram criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, and treatment of rheumatic fever complications. This year, we have the honor of hearing from Dr. Cheryl Anderson on the topic of diet and cardiovascular health disparities. Dr. Anderson is a professor and dean of the University of California, San Diego, Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science with a joint appointment in the Department of Medicine Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. She serves as director of the UCSD Center of Excellence in Health Promotion and Equity. Dr. Anderson's research is focused on nutrition as a means to prevent chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and diet-related cancers. This body of research aims to equitably improve human health and eliminate disparities in health that occur based on personal environmental factors. Her work on dietary sodium, blood pressure, and cardiovascular health has influenced nutrition, um, nutrition policy and behavioral strategies for the prevention and management of cardiovascular diseases and chronic kidney disease. Dr. Anderson also served on the National Academy of Medicine's Food and Nutrition Board and the 2015 U.S. Dietary Guidelines and Advisory Committee. She is the chair of the American Heart Association Council on Epidemiology and Prevention and the immediate past chair of AHA's Nutrition Committee. She currently serves on the editorial board of circulation and annual reviews of nutrition. She was also elected to the U.S. National Academy of Medicine in 2016. We're so excited to hear you talk, Dr. Anderson. Um, for the group, I want to remind you, please put any questions you may have in the chat or in the Q&A box. And if you'd like to ask your question in person, just raise your hand virtually and um, I'll let you share your video. Right. Thank you so much, Joyce. I um, am honored really to be here for um, this memorialization of Dr. Sokolo and his family um, in this great effort uh, and, and to just honor his career. I also want to say thank you to you for shepherding me through this process and um, say a, a brief hello to my friends, uh, Greg Marcus and Michelle Albert. Thanks uh, for, for having me with you today. I wish it were in person. So it's a pleasure really to be able to talk to you about diet and cardiovascular health. Um, when I think about this, um, I wanna give you a little bit of context about me because I think it, it helps you understand why I selected this topic for today. So, you know, when I was training in nutrition science, I learned to do very tightly controlled nutrition intervention studies to address biological relationships between diet and health. However, my career goal was to really impact significantly the public's health, right? Thinking about hundreds of thousands of or millions of people at a time. And when I tried to integrate and synchronize these biologically based studies that I was doing, there was this disconnect. While there was efficacy um, clearly demonstrated uh, through the science, the effectiveness and that sort of pragmatic nature that was necessary for true change really suffered. So as my career uh, matured, I began to think more systematically about the incorporation of human behavior as well as social systems. And that's what I wanna share with you um, more about that work today. So I've titled this talk, The Interrelationships Between the Biological, Behavioral and Social Influences, um, because while we know that diet is the cornerstone for cardiovascular health promotion as well as cardiovascular disease prevention, the experience that we have with using diet, I think translates to so many other health exposures and initiatives. So for example, many factors come to bear on whether or not one can change their diets or one can meet the recommendations that, that we put forward. Similarly, many factors will come to bear on how we get people to treatment goals, right? How do you control risk factors? 
Um, and how do we get serious about really removing the barriers that sit between what happens in the clinical exchange and what happens when people leave the clinic and try to do these things um, within the societal context within which they live, learn, work, play, or pray. So I like this, um, this graphic because it summarizes not only the top 10 causes of deaths, it also um, summarizes the associated risk factors. And this is for data across all ages uh, within the US population summarized at the Institute um, and metrics for health evaluation up at the University of Washington in Seattle. And they um, you know, are constantly producing um, data around the global burden of disease. And what we see here um, are clearly uh, chronic conditions uh, being the top causes of death uh, in the US, but the associated risk factors have dietary risks uh, sitting at the very top. And what that means is that you know, if we're going to make a real dent in the excess um, mortality that we see from uh, various chronic conditions, cardiovascular conditions being uh, primary, we're really going to have to target diet. So by the time we're done today, uh, the, these are the four things I'd like for us to be able to do. One is really think about disparities in at least one measure of health status or in cardiovascular disease mortality across uh, racial ethnic groups. Um, given that I'm, you're not nutrition scientists, uh, be able to identify at least two dietary factors um, associated with cardiovascular health. And we'll think about that on a sort of a truly nutrient uh, level as well as an, on, on an environmental level as well. Um, be able to use a public health framework to think about this interrelationship between the biological, the behavioral and social, and then explain to a colleague why achieving health equity really requires a multidisciplinary focus. It re requires us to think beyond the clinic setting. So here's the outline that I'll follow. First, I'll talk about disparities in CBD mortality and um, disparities in measures of health status. And then I'll focus on diet, the food environment, and what that means for cardiovascular health, transitioning to the socioecological model um, as uh, ca for cardiovascular disease and really flipping the narrative to cardiovascular health, and then the implications that this has for clinical care and public health policy. And then we'll have questions and answers. So thinking about disparities in CBD uh, mortality and measures of health status. So we want to study health status or we want to think about uh, health status for several reasons. One is we want to know about illness, right? We want to know about deaths. Um, we want to know about factors that are less precise than death, but nonetheless quite meaningful. And so we monitor trends. You see this happening through data from um, the National Center for Health Statistics and through our national vital statistics systems. And um, here on the screen, uh, we see uh, data for uh, heart disease death rates uh, by county in the US on the left side of my screen, on the right side of my screen, uh, stroke death rates. And we know that there are disparities by place. It's so obvious um, when we uh, look at the, the death rates in this fashion. And we have underlying we have their underlying reasons that we can hypothesize about for why um, the data play out in the way that they play out. We can also measure um, mortality differences by uh, racial ethnic groups when we look at life expectancy and we look at preventable cardiovascular disease deaths. So on the left side of my, at my screen, you see life expectancy plotted across time. Uh, these are data from 2007 to 2017, uh, showing lowest life expectancy in Blacks who are not Hispanic. And on the right side of my screen, we see deaths per 100,000 population, again, plotted across time, where we see that um, the highest rates of preventable cardiovascular disease deaths are experienced by Black, and ma black males and females um, in this country. When we look at the age-adjusted uh, total cardiovascular disease mortality rates by race ethnicity, um, we also see striking persistent differences uh, over time uh, within uh, racial ethnic um, groups uh, with non-Hispanic Blacks uh, having the highest age-adjusted death rates, getting better over time, but nonetheless um, still higher um, at any time point that we examine. Another way of thinking about um, burden of, of, of disease is not just by looking at mortality. That doesn't really express the entire burden. Um, we can look at healthy life expectancy, and that is the number of a healthy life expected on average in a population where you live in good health without impairments from disease or disability. 
And there are marked demographic and regional variations in healthy life expectancy. On the left side of my screen, you see um, hail by race uh, across states among those who live to uh, 65 years in the US. Uh, from the morbidity and mortality weekly reports, um, you see that the variability there is, is quite significant. On the right side of the screen, you see global data. Um, these are broken down by World Bank uh, Income Group with um, the highest uh, hail being in high income countries and the lowest hail being in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, while I've been focusing so far on, you know, mortality and disease, I want to talk about cardiovascular health, a different paradigm, right? A more, a prevention paradigm. Um, and I was really excited, you know, 10 years ago when the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association proposed a population metric to define and track um, our nation's cardiovascular health over time. Uh, it was released uh, as a score. That score was called Life's uh, Simple Seven. And it includes uh, seven factors that we might uh, want to monitor for, for cardiovascular health, including having a healthy weight, a healthy diet, meeting recommendations for physical activity, not using tobacco, having normal blood pressure, normal cholesterol, and normal fasting blood glucose. Now, the science on Life Simple 7 uh, metrics has actually been quite robust uh, since this metric was developed. Here are data um, from the Atherosclerosis Risk in Community Studies, or ARIC, where we see that the cardiovascular health metrics are very strongly um, linked to incident cardiovascular disease events. And we, uh, on the left side of the screen, have cumulative incidents plotted against follow-up time within, that, within um, ARIC. And those who have the, um, those who have the, have met the most, have the most cardiovascular health metrics met have also um, the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease. On the right side, you see age, sex, and race adjusted um, incidence rates uh, per um, in, 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 in person years. And then um, the bars uh, show the number of ideal health behaviors um, and the number of ideal health factors, uh, where again, uh, if you have um, a high rate of a high, a high number of health behaviors and health factors being met, um, the uh, age adjusted, race adjusted. Uh, incidence rates are um, lowest. When we look at race ethnic differences in the percent of people achieving five or more uh, ideal cardiovascular health metrics, um, we see that the data are disparate for um, across the, the racial ethnic groups. Um, these aren't uh, longitudinal data. Um, but we can all we can see here that the likelihood is um, is 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 less so in in um, in racial ethnic minority groups. So here um, we see plotted the likelihood of achieving five or more ideal um, health metrics and that variability by education um, or income. So those with higher educational attainment. And those farthest from the poverty level um, are more likely to achieve um, five or more ideal cardiovascular health metrics. So a story is playing out here um, that suggests to us that the attainment of Life Simple 7 or um, you know, greater cardiovascular health is really tied into some other really critical factors. Now there's also um, some complexity that is worth mentioning. There's a close and sometimes bi-directional relationship um, that happens between cardiovascular risk factors and these health uh, factors. So when we um, look at obesity, for example, as a risk factor, we know that um, it's influenced by our lifestyle, our diet and our physical activity, but the presence of obesity can also confound um, how one approaches their diet and their physical activity. And there are resultant um, factors such as hyperglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, that would happen in, in, in an individual who is obese. In terms of uh, racial ethnic differences in obesity prevalence among uh, US adults, these data from the National Center for Health Statistics 
um, show us that, again, the burden isn't borne evenly across uh, ra racial ethnic groups um, with uh, higher prevalences amongst um, those who are um, non-Hispanic, Black, and, um, his and Hispanic. So I want to just switch here um, to talk a little bit about this template that we could probably think about in multiple other uh, exposure spaces, but using diet as an example here and how that plays out in the relationship between cardiovascular health and the challenges um, that we see with meeting dietary recommendations that has implications for uh, some of the other factors that you all uh, may be interested in studying or talking about later. So the classic diet um, heart hypothesis, when we first started thinking about it as a risk factor, was, um, you know, gave us the biological basis for doing this work. Uh, high levels of saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet um, led to plaques forming in the arteries, coronary artery narrowing, and eventually NMI. We've, of course, expanded, you know, how we think about dietary factors and um, CVD risk since then. Uh, here you see data from a World Health Organization technical report just summarizing where we have convincing evidence in the area of clinical trials or um, observational studies that are prospective in nature uh, for factors that will decrease or increase risk. And um, then we have a sense of what's maybe moderately associated and uh, maybe loosely associated. So there are lots of factors that we need to think about um, in terms of diet and, and CBD. When we look locally here in San Diego at how things play out with regards to um, behaviors and uh, diseases, we have a concept that we use called 3450 um, in our Live Well San Diego um, mantra. And we see uh, that three behaviors, having inadequate physical activity, poor diets and tobacco use, result in the four diseases cancers, heart disease and stroke, type two diabetes, which arguably is a you know, CBD equivalent and lung disease that are responsible for more than 50% of the deaths in San Diego. So, you know, I see um, the kinds of um, relationships in, in San Diego is having huge relevance for uh, what you all might be seeing, you know, up in the Bay Area and what we see across the country. And so it really is a nice platform um, from, which, from which to think about uh, how we start to impact um, the behaviors and um, ultimately then, you know, get at the uh, excess deaths that, that, we, that are occurring. So akin to what I mentioned earlier about cardiovascular health factors, diet's been mechanistically uh, linked to risk factors through observational epidemiology and clinical trials. So if we were sort of to take a look behind the curtain on those WHO factors that I mentioned about a minute ago, um, how we got there um, was really through research, uh, largely uh, clinical trials, thinking about the effect that diet has on you know, the risk factors you see here, lipids, lipoproteins, high blood pressure, thrombolic tendency, cardiac rhythm, endothelial function, systemic inflammation, insulin sensitivity, oxidative stress, right? And what those mean or the risk that is conferred for CVD uh, down the road. You rarely see us being able to do the direct to CVD um, types of studies because five years just simply isn't um, enough time. And that's usually what NIH gives us when we are uh, putting our grants together. Nonetheless, um, the way that it's studied in, in these epidemiologic studies is very um, interesting, right? We think about macronutrients, um, we think about micronutrients. So, you know, in my case, I think a lot about sodium and potassium. Um, we think about anthropometrics, something that we know is very, very tightly linked um, to one's dietary intake. Sometimes it's an additive uh, type of analysis where we're talking about added sugars or it's a dietary pattern where we say, what do people do most of the time? And how does that matter for, for outcomes? The literature is flooded um, with this type of work. Um, and what I think we really should be thinking about if we want to extend from uh, the simple biology to really trying to integrate um, behaviors and thinking about our social structures and systems, is a look at the environment around us, right? We know that our genes are, are likely to load the gun, but it's the environment around us that ends up pulling the trigger. So when it comes to diet, um, we know that food environments influence what people eat. 
If you have access to uh, fresh food and varied foods, um, then likely purchases will happen and consumption might follow. I used to live and work in Baltimore, um, and this is what I saw outside my office window. Inside, um, when this shop opens, um, is a, you know, ava the availability of, of food products. Um, this was pre-COVID, so these are not plexiglass shields to minimize risk of infection transmission. These are actually bulletproof uh, windows um, for which you um, order your food uh, from, you know, behind the window, and you try to figure out and navigate your way through the recommendations that we're currently uh, making for individuals. This is um, not to be undervalued uh, in our thinking about how we do this type of uh, research and science and think about policy recommendations. So when, you know, I would do interventions in, in, in Baltimore, I'd make it my life's work to go into the various neighborhoods and really look inside these markets so that I could credibly um, talk about how we would address any macronutrient, micronutrient, dietary patterns, uh, issues that um, were involved in the intervention. Additionally, when we think about environmental factors, we are fighting a bit of an uphill battle here. So the food system has changed in such a way that you know, 20 years ago, the amount of um, calories, sugars, salt, fat that you would get from standard uh, purchases outside of the home really um, were quite significantly lower than what one might get today. You know, a cup of coffee um, is a magnitude um, higher in terms of your calories and, and your sugars. Similarly, you know, movie theater popcorn or um, a hamburger. And we have to always be um, thinking about uh, with any recommendations that we make, the battle that people fight to get back to um, some ordinary sense of, of intake. Uh, we've also made it really cheap and convenient to get a lot of calories and um, very poor nutrition. Um, I took this from my car window. Um, this is a, a, an advertisement for a product where you can essentially bring home uh, for $1 uh, a Burger, pat, burger that has multiple patties within it. It's got, you know, secret sauces, you know, added bacon and things of that sort. Um, and you imagine, you know, a family um, who might have an economic challenge uh, trying to make decisions about uh, how they will nourish and, um, and feed a family. And we're making it really attractive to go in the direction that is not of a very high nutritional value. So a couple of years ago, um, Laura Cobb was a PhD student in my lab and we worked together to uh, look at the relationship of the lo local food environment with obesity. And we were actually kind of surprised um, at, how, um, at, at how this played out. So despite the large number of studies that were available, we found 71 studies across 65 cohorts um, there was really limited evidence for any association between the local food environment and we chose obesity as an outcome, um, would have been really hard to do with, with CBD. Um, but we, you know, nonetheless, um, really thought that this null association should be in, in, interpreted cautiously because of the low quality of the available studies. And so, um, you know, this work needs to um, mature a bit uh, but nonetheless, um, there are um, really, uh, you know, things that we can see with our eyes and, and we can use our senses to, to try and link. Um, we really need to begin to lay the foundation for how we can systematically think about uh, looking at that um, within the scientific um, space. So that was a quick tour through uh, some of the dietary factors associated with cardiovascular health. And it can be a bit daunting to think about how to systematically connect it all. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about um, some public health frameworks that might uh, help to anchor um, how we do this. The socioecological model, um, for those of you who may have your MPH or you know, took some public health classes, um, is a really uh, sort of fundamental way that we think in public health about um, not just laying everything on an individual's shoulders, but really thinking about um, the various spheres of influence around them that will matter for their outcomes. So here's a, um, a figure from Jim Hill's um, group. And, and 
it really, in trying to help us understand energy balance, um, highlights um, the importance of not just looking at individual factors such as demographics, um, particularly you know, age, sex, socioeconomic status, uh, race, ethnicity, um, but also thinking about behavioral settings that these decisions that individuals are making uh, come within their communities where they work, you know, their home settings, um, the sectors of influence that bear upon um, this decision-making process, our governments, local, um, you know, regional, the industries around us that um, promote various types of food beverage um, intakes that impact the retail um, availability within um, neighborhoods that think about the um, entertainment that people have and what's available within uh, their recreational spaces, as well as the social norms and values. So I, a number of years ago, had the pleasure of working with uh, Mercedes Carnathan, who's at uh, Northwestern University, on a scientific statement around cardiovascular health in African Americans. Um, and we did this for the American Heart Association. And we found that there was a higher prevalence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, and relatively earlier age of onset of um, these conditions among African Americans. And it really um, was an important uh, step in us thinking about, you know, why the relationships that we've seen thus far in terms of mortality or other measures of health status and the, the factors that we see, um, such as diet, that are, are related to these, these risk factors may be playing out in disparate ways um, in this particular community. And we really sort of hit head on this idea that these persistent disparities were multifactorial and they span from the individual level um, to the social environment. And then we concluded um, that the strategies needed to promote equity required really a broad um, set of stakeholder input, including clinicians and others from across uh, multiple disciplines. Well, in 2020, um, we had a very critical national conversation happening around uh, structural and systemic racism. And I couldn't have been happier um, to see this uh, American Heart Association presidential advisory uh, led by Keith Churchwell um, that focused on kind of what do we mean by race, right? Um, how do we think about um, racism um, as a fundamental driver of these health disparities and linking back for the first time that I'd seen in a, in a prominent um, cl clinical journal, linking back to um, some of the systems and structures that really go upstream of um, where we might be typically starting uh, with race. So this is a figure um, from that, that paper. And it shows us that we, while we wanna think about the sort of increased uh, stress and risk factor burden that's playing out um, in, in, in communities, we also need to go upstream a bit, right? And starting back to the days of slavery and the structures of racism that to this day maintain white supremacy, um, the post-emancipation structures of racism that maintain white privilege, thinking about racial bias within the justice system that plays out through um, you know, things like segregation. Um, we see it in uh, how people experience um, air pollution, environmental health, their, to my example today, you know, their dietary intake, um, the redlining in communities, the targeting of Black people, um, and then how this then links back to having poor access to health care, the poor housing conditions and physical environments, the school systems not being funded well, and a lack of access to capital. So, you know, ultimately, um, I'm calling right now to the conversation that we'll likely have at the end of this talk for us to think about um, how upstream uh, factors impact um, our health. So we're, we're gonna acknowledge that, you know, while we have a um, sort of need for multifactorial, multifactorial approaches, we also need to wrap our brains around um, what is happening in um, in those kind of upstream factors and how do we um, 
address them concurrently while we're thinking about what, what what's happening in the clinical space. So this is this infographic just shows us how big the contribution is for social and economic um, factors. Yes, clinical care matters, and we have to continue to make sure maintain access to care and high quality care. Yes, the health behaviors are fundamental, and we need to keep them um, at bay, intervene upon them in a primary or primordial prevention um, approach. Thinking of the physical environment, now when it comes to educational attainment, employment, income, the family and social support, whether or not a community is safe, the contribution here is quite significant and fundamentally um, linked to uh, health inequities, um, tying back, as we saw in the, um, the figure by uh, Keith Churchwell and, and colleagues, uh, structural and uh, potentially systemic racism. So if we want to um, achieve cardiovascular health, what really needs to happen here? Well, instead of um, looking at the just sort of, you know, what's in front of us right now, why'd you show up um, for a, a visit with a cardiologist, really thinking about did, is, has there been um, access to care and adequate coverage of the expenses associated with that care to maintain and sustain um, continued care? Um, also, is there quality preventive care happening um, for these metabolic risk factors? Thinking about, um, you know, finally now there's um, going to be reimbursement for, um, for nutrition services, but for a long time that wasn't necessarily the case um, and we caught people far too, too, too late. And then equal access to healthy foods and the addressing of uh, food insecurity. We need to think about the structural environment that support, supports uh, healthy lifestyles, including the ability to exercise, having stable and adequate residence and employment, um, giving people a living wage, thinking about high quality childcare and education and the interpersonal and psychosocial support that is necessary um, to ensure um, these outcomes. So, I, you know, I'm here um, having this conversation with you all um, because I think education of clinicians and other providers about this complex interrelationship um, is so key um, to getting to uh, cardiovascular health outcomes that are equitably distributed. So now I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what does this mean for, for clinical care and for the public health policies that are gonna support the recommendations that you make in the clinic. Well, I hope that um, life in the clinic's a little easier than it is in the public health space when you're trying to make um, policy, particularly ones that support um, diets. So for years, um, I, you know, in my um, work to impact uh, high blood pressure, um, awareness, um, treatment and control uh, within this country and abroad, um, focused on, on salt as a major, um, in, in, um, a major factor involved in, in, in the development of hypertension. And we'd have pushback from, uh, from advocacy groups like the Salt Institute. Um, and they would say things like, no, no, no. I don't know what you know, those scientists are. We have very prominent people as members, prominent, prominent scientists as members of the Salt Institute saying, Americans are eating just the right amount of salt. If you get too much, the body just simply uh, eliminates it. So um, when we are thinking about the science, we also, and what we're telling patients, we also have to be thinking about these other forces that are um, coming into um, the governmental space, coming into the restaurant industries, coming into um, advertisements and, and marketing uh, within communities. The dietary guidelines we've had um, since the 40s um, to help us anchor uh, what we, do within this country in every federally supported um, nutrition space uh, to help Americans have a better shot at um, ideal cardiovascular health. And this year's uh, 2020, well, we're living under the 2020 guidelines until uh, 2025. So for this year, uh, some of the things that are on the minds of policymakers, as well as um, federally funded um, agencies that carry out nutrition programs, are how do we customize um, and enjoy nutrient dense foods and beverages that reflect people's personal preferences, their culture, their traditions, their budgets. And I'm really um, pleased to see this enhanced focus from the dietary guidelines because 
Um, if we can actually get people to be adherent to the guidelines, we know that they're likely to have you know, smaller waists, they're likely to have lower insulin resistance, a reduced odds of carotid atherosclerosis, a slower progression of atherosclerosis, and lower total and cardiovascular disease mortality. So it's really worth uh, getting people there. How are we doing um, in, the, in the sort of public space around this? Well, the healthy eating index is one measure of um, how well we um, are doing in, in, in how we eat according to guidelines. The to maximum total score for the healthy eating index is 100. And what we see um, in this graphic is that across childhood and adolescence, we lose um, um, score, we lose um, points on the healthy eating index. Starts at about, you know, in the 60s, which is far from ideal um, in our young children. And then it's plummeted to the 50s by the time um, you're in the age group of 14 to 18. When we take a deeper dive um, into these data, we see that what's going on with regards to um, how people do according to recommendations um, in the space of total vegetable intake, total fruit intake, um, and whole grain consumption, low fat dairy and low, um, low fat total proteins, um, we can't get quite get there. These blue graphs below the line um, show us the percent of the population that's below recommendation. And then above the line, we see that where we're above recommendation is in the space of refined grains um, and uh, you know, resultant uh, total grains, and then um, overconsumption of total protein foods, meats, poultry, eggs, and largely um, in the spaces of those that aren't lower in fat. So a lot of work um, needs to be done from a policy level um, and, and dissemination and implementation level in this space. When we look across the life course um, through younger adulthood um, and um, beyond, uh, we see that the healthy eating index score is in the you know, sort of high 50s. And that's a real challenge um, as we try to think about how you get people from knowing what the recommendation is to actually um, being adherent to it. And again, we see the various um, areas of, of diet for which it's just seemingly really hard um, to meet those recommendations. Um, when it comes to nutrients of concern for overconsumption, such as added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium, I'll show you here because I've got a series of, of um, graphs within the older age groups. Um, and I just wanna orient you to it so we can get through it quickly that the blue bars are those who are within the recommended limit. And then the orange bars are for the proportion of the population that exceeds the limit. And it doesn't take you very long to see that whether we're talking added sugars, saturated fat or sodium, um, the proportion that is exceeding the limit is um, really quite uh, ex extensive and a bit overwhelming when we try to think about how do we get this done. A similar story unfolds for uh, later adulthood, 31 through, through 59, where the HEI is um, still in the high 50s. Again, you see here a similar pattern for added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium. Um, the HEI um, gets a little bit higher in older adulthood, but I don't have to spend a lot of time telling you all that that can often be too late, right? These shifts are um, sometimes a reaction to the loss of cardiovascular health where risk factor uh, profiles are starting to emerge that are unfavorable and um, then prompting a use of diet as more of a mitigator, mitigator than as a prevention factor. And again, again, a, quite a struggle with sugars, fat, and, and sodium. So when we think about like, what are we, go what are we actually going to do in order to um, get these better outcomes? Um, now more than ever in my career, um, as I've been as an epidemiologist, you know, thinking about person's place and time, I see how much place matters. And this was largely driven home um, through the initiative of building a better, building a healthier America that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation commissioned a while back, where they started putting these maps together. And this is one from uh, New Orleans, where across a five-mile span in New Orleans, we see a shift in life expectancy of 25 years. Um, in the Lakewood neighborhood um, where you know, grocery stores are, are um, common and um, you know, sort of lifestyles are 
are just higher and better. Um, we see a higher life expectancy than we do in, in the French Quarter in the Lafitte Trem um, neighborhood, for example, um, where you know their struggle to um, address social determinants of health and really um, think about the creation of uh, spaces and places um, that are going to be promoting health. And this to me is just unacceptable. I mean, it's so it's really part of why I get up every day so fired up about um, doing the kind of work that I do and really trying to think system, systems wide uh, versus um, simply focusing on the biology. So, you know, in, in terms of, in, if we're gonna address our very last uh, learning objective here, which, you know, I talked about, you know, the why, like why do we wanna consider multiple levels um, of challenges to achieving uh, cardiovascular health? You know, let's say you have in the clinic a 42 year old mom of three has obesity and uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension. And, you know, you wanna focus on lifestyle modification. Here you have a patient who's motivated to make uh, changes. However, um, if the interaction uh, allows, you can kind of take a deeper dive and you begin to understand, well, maybe a lot of this is happening because, you know, they're in that um, Lafitte Trem neighborhood. There aren't neighbor, nearby stores with healthy food options. Maybe there's, you know, a, an economics um, ex concern here, limited money for groceries, um, depending on, on wages. Um, maybe they're working um, multiple jobs, um, having limited time to prepare uh, fresh foods, thus, you know, getting the added sugars, uh, fats, and, and sodium from prepared foods. Maybe there's limited opportunities for exercise, particularly um, in, in a neighborhood that may not be safe. And if you're working late, you know, you can't do it at night. There's uncertainty maybe regarding other aspects of um, life, electricity, utilities, thinking about caring for other vulnerable individuals in the home, not having a whole lot of time for self, whether it's children or um, multi-generational uh, households with older parents needing support, and having a high level of uh, psychosocial stress related to these and other factors. So you could just see um, how daunting it could possibly be to just leave your recommendation um, there when you um, know that there's so many other things that are going to impact um, what we know about efficacy in trying to have these data um, to have these data play out in a more pragmatic way. I just want to close um, by talking a little bit about um, the frame of mind that we may need to be in to actually um, get to the behavioral and the, the social issues. So over the last year or so, you may have seen graphics such as this show up in talks um, such as mine, um, where we try to give people a real visual around what does it mean to offer equal support and what does it mean to offer equitable support? And we see here that you know everybody getting the same support really doesn't um, ultimately address um, the issue that you're trying to address. But when you adjust that support, tailor it um, to a person's need, um, you can sort of get a bit, a bit farther along. But I'm going to challenge us um, to move a little bit farther along than from equity and to really maybe focus more on, on a social justice goal. So um, this infographic shows us you know, a group of people trying to see a game. And you give equal support. It doesn't take care of it. You still have you know, one of the three being unable to see. You give equitable support, putting the support where it's needed and you address the issue, you can see um, over the fence that's causing the problem. But if we took a social justice lens at this and really tried to get at the root cause of the, um, of the problem, then we'd remove the fence and address that systemic barrier. And I um, dare say that that's what we're called um, to do right now in the space of thinking about um, cardiovascular health and um, diet or other um, risk factors. In the case of diet, um, this is going to require us to revamp our food system, right? We can no longer just sit things on, on the shoulder of the individual. We really have to think about engaging stakeholders in every part of the system, the industry, what's going on in public health, in medicine, um, in communities, um, in the agricultural space, as well as in policy spaces that are local governments, uh, state, uh, federal governments and even international governments. And so um, I you know, bring this graphic back to us just to again, anchor us in that socio-ecological um, model um, and 
I think you, you know, really can't put it any clearer around, you know, what happens in those 10 minutes um, in the clinic um, really uh, have a, a host of factors that challenge um, the patient's ability to actually uh, get there. So I wanna say at this point, you know, thank you for listening to this talk. I hope we have lots of time for question and I hope I've done um, Dr. Sokolo's work and his uh, legacy uh, some justice here. I've uh, given all of the good things that he um, did in the space of hypertension and um, hoping hopefully we can pull in um, some deeper conversation around other things that will really matter. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. That was such a wonderful talk. Um, again, I'll leave some time for people to uh, put any questions in the chat box or in the q and I'm glad you ended on that uh, topic about a multidisciplinary approach. Have you had any experience or thoughts on the utility of multimodality or multidisciplinary clinics to help um, when approaching patients who tend to have poor controlled cardiovascular disease? Yeah. So, um, you know, a number of years ago, um, working with uh, Lisa Cooper, who is um, a really amazing uh, scientist in the space of uh, thinking about disparities in hypertension and um, how we might address them, our goal was to um, reduce disparities in, in high blood pressure across the Baltimore um, region. And what we did within the clinic space was one, to try and set things up in a way that when we left with the grant, it would still be functioning. So we had the clinic actually hire on um, the care management team that would include a registered dietitian and a, a PharmD um, who would address issues of uh, medication adherence and um, sort of medication regimen. And you know, thinking about that um, sort of multifaceted approach in addition to what the clinician could do, uh, really mattered um, for for outcomes. And you know, that's just just one example of thinking about how do you diversify that space in a way that different conversations happen with different um, ex expert groups. Um, we also, and there, there, you know, sometimes the clinician can can totally manage it. Um, I'll, um, but there are other times where it really helps to be able to say, you know, we can't do it all in, in this interaction. However, we do have here these options. Another um, space where I think is really exciting is that, you know, when that prescription happens for lifestyle, the various barriers that, you know, I've, I've named uh, throughout the talk don't just go away, even if you have within the clinic, right? Someone who's expert in these spaces and can really talk it through. And I think you, at least you get that credibility, right? When you're in the clinical interaction. But um, the, there's, a, a, um, there's some data emerging and one of the really nice um, studies published by uh, Pete Miller and his group um, is on a five plus nuts and beans is what they called it. But essentially they use the library systems within communities to house uh, nutritious food deliveries for people who may be working late or who may um, you know, have sort of a challenge of making it out to a grocery store. So you could actually have a delivery point that's local, trusted, accessible, that can hang on to the delivery until you're able to get to it and take it home, right? So again, removing those kind of structural issues that can sometimes get in the way of actually getting to consumption. That's great. I had um, the opportunity to work in the Bronx back after college. And one thing that I really enjoyed part of my job description kind of was doing healthy uh, cooking demonstrations in the clinics, actually, where we had high rates of hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes and obesity. And it was also very useful because there were a lot of cultural dishes that are heavy in starches, heavy in fats where we gave people an opportunity to learn different ways to substitute out those less beneficial macronutrients. So that was a great experience that I had. Yeah. We have a question here from Dr. Parikh. Um, MDs don't get training on nutrition. What are your thoughts about how this can be improved in medical training so we can better serve our patients? Yeah, hi Nisha, how are you? Thank you for the question. Um, this is this is such a long-standing issue, and um, we recently published um, a, a paper, a scientific statement through the American Heart Association, um, talking about uh, this very very issue. So that's number one. It's kind of all like kind of outlined um, in, in in that space. But I think 
it can't it can't be a one off, right? Um, just like every other um, thing that we we find important, we try to find ways to really integrate it into the training. And so I think it really has to be a part of um, you know the the curriculum in from day one through you know day one thousand. And the the way that we're probably likely to make some some headway here is that in addition to having clinicians be knowledgeable in, enough in the space to know what they don't know, right, is to not also expect um, expertise, right, expert behavior. And so pairing and bringing into the clinical space um, registered dietitians, um, you know, other providers who kind of have this expertise um, and who can support and um, help to sort of get these, these challenges overcome is also going to be important. And the reimbursement for that um, service is also key. So we're finally starting to see now, um, you know, shifts in, in reimbursement, not only for, I think it was for a long time, it was only for um, CKD um, and, and like really toward the end, later stages of CKD. And now we see um, that that's available for other conditions. So yeah, thank you um, for the question, Nisha. And um, thank you, Rita, for your comment as well. It's great that you're here. Wondering if I could talk a bit more about how the hail is determined. Um, yeah, so the um, healthy life expectancy, what happens is, um, it, it, you know, this is, this is akin to um, the concept of disability adjusted life years. So the dailies, the qualies, quality adjusted, quality adjusted life years, and really a flipping of those paradigm uh, from not just trying to get people to not have disease, but to actually think about how do we protect the, the health that we're all sort of, not all, but the majority of us come into to life with. And um, so health adjusted life years is a way of framing it um, in a more prevention oriented space and thinking about how do we um, capture how many years you can have um, without being impacted or shifting into the um, disease management space. And so um, we, uh, through the World Health Organization and um, you know, the various, um, I guess they, I, I guess I would call them their various um, geographic uh, location spaces, they, they monitor um, this health adjusted um, life years. And so um, we can, again, think more about health versus disease. I'm going to allow um, Dr. Redbird to ask. I think she might have wanted to ask something in person. Okay. Oh, no. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can that's fine. And I, Cheryl, that was great. And um, it's such an important topic and really great to hear about your work. Um, in, in particular, if I wanted to use HAIL, and we can take this offline if it's getting too technical, I'm just curious how one would calculate it. Is it anything like qualies or it's very different? And that that's what I was wondering about. So either now or another time is good for us. Uh, yes, absolutely. We can um, we can talk through how you, you calculate it. Um, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> It's tricky, but yes, um, Rita, why don't we follow up and, yeah. and, um, and do that offline? Great. It's generally, it's generally calculated for us. Right? Uh -huh. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have another question here from Michelle Murray. Um, she says CPT codes are in development for health and wellness coaching. Do you have any suggestions as to how health coaching might be incorporated into clinical settings? Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's a great uh, question. And there's actually quite a bit of data to support this, Michelle. Um, one of the things that I think that the, the tension, right, is that when, for the, for those in greatest need, the social factors that come to bear on the clinical interaction are non-trivial. So, you know, you have, you've got the provider time burden and then you have the patient time burden. And, you know, sometimes you have a patient who took three buses, you know, in, in San Diego, if you're coming from the South Bay, it's gonna take you two hours if you don't have a car um, to get to La Jolla to get care, 
And so now, you know, you've spent uh, two hours chunk of time trying to come in and you want to make the most of the time that you have there, but you also don't want to make that time necessarily so burdensome. So I think in addition to having the presence of uh, health coaches within the clinic, we also need to really um, rely on telehealth, mobile health, um, thinking more about sort of our digital solutions. You know, we can now wirelessly uh, transmit and communicate around blood pressure monitoring, um, really thinking about um, giving patients what they need, the skills, the um, support in order to self-manage and titrate and record and monitor um, at home with that support that we can um, use from a, in a digital space. So I think the presence of the coach is great, but we've got to advance as soon as possible um, to using some of these uh, digital solutions because um, you know, if we look in the UK data around um, the, um, the, the, the trials for self-managing through both blood pressure monitors and um, titration, you really get a, a sense that it's possible, right? They've even incorporated into, into their guidelines. Here, we're a bit more um, hesitant, um, but the data are emerging. I know people are doing these studies right now. Um, and I would say it's not too early, really, based on um, that er those early wins that we've seen in other parts of the world. That's great. I, I wanted to ask one more question before we run out of time. Um, it appeared that there might have been some form of a, a gender disparity in the health uh, the healthy eating index scores. I'm not sure what the P of that is or whether it's significant, but I was wondering if you could comment on, on what you know about that. Yeah, so a lot of what we, um, what we hypothesize here is a caloric um, disparity. So we have to kind of adjust for caloric intake because along with calories, we'll track more sugars, more fats, more salts, et cetera. And um, that's likely where the gender differences in, in the scores appear. Um, typically, uh, males are eating more than females, and so they're carrying with them more of the nutrients of concern. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. This was a wonderful talk. I hope we can set up a time to meet in person in the near future, but we will try to set up a virtual meeting with some of the faculty and trainee. And if anyone on the call is interested in joining, please feel free to email me. Um, we will be seeing you, everyone else uh, next week. And thank you again, Dr. Anderson. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right, you too. Bye.